without further ado, <laughs> we will bring up Harry Dent. And as I mentioned, I've been following his work for 25 years. He's been on the, uh, the podcast maybe, I don't know, eight, 10 times now, and uh, just, uh, just has fantastic information. One of the things I really love about Harry's work is that um, demographics don't lie. You know, there's an old saying that demographics are destiny. Demographics are destiny. And I really think that's true because uh, people do very predictable things at certain ages. You know, when they're in the family formation stage, uh, they buy baby food and they buy diapers, <laughs> you know. Uh, and when they are in uh, their peak earning stage, uh, they spend money. And when they get to retirement age, they downsize their houses and they become more conservative. And so this is just all very predictable stuff. Now, um, what Harry teaches, I, I think, and you know, he can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but um, one of his very popular ideas is called the S-curve. And uh, he is, uh, I'm sure, going to talk about that today and can really demonstrate uh, a lot of very, very interesting and very reliable things when it comes to the dangerous business, the dangerous business of predictions, <laughs> okay? Uh, that is a risky business and uh, very few are really willing to take it on, but Harry is, and, uh, uh, and so it's great to have him here. Uh, welcome to Harry Dent. Give him a big hand, folks. Thanks, Jason, and uh, good day, everybody. Um, I'm used to saying that because I'm talking to Australians all the time now. Um, so what I'm going to do today, people, some people might be familiar with what I do. Uh, I'm not going to go all my forecasting tools. I'm going to give you a summary of them. I'm going to focus a little more today on what's been happening with this incredible endless stimulus program and printing money and stimulus to keep a dead economy going and, and the highest stock market in history and one of the worst economies in history and why that's happening. But most important, if people have been listening to me off and on for the last several months, I've been saying, you know, we've got a major bubble, the greatest bubble in modern history, certainly the greatest of our lifetimes and the greatest we will see. And I've been saying it, it you know, we had that first crash, which, which was the first sign that the bubble was peaking in February, March. That, that, but, but we're in that rebound phase. And, and, and I was saying that phase might at the latest last till the election. I am not seeing that now. I'm seeing a lot of evidence that this is, is this top, this unbelievable top that's been building since 2009 with again, endless money printing up 20 to $25 trillion now globally and now all these new stimulus programs and stuff to keep an economy that should have deleveraged, should have gone through a deeper downturn 2008 to 2010, like we did from uh, 29 to 32 in the Great Depression, deleverage a lot of debt, get rid of a lot of zombie failing companies, clear out the deck so we could grow again. And of course, central banks decided they were smarter than God, Mother Nature, or whatever you want to call it and that they were just going to engineer a new economy that never has recessions. Oh, that's really smart of them. Here's the next chart. Here's the monetary base. The greatest expansion, this money printing, is they, they buy their own bonds, accumulate these bonds, take them off the market, which pushes down interest rates and, and, and has a lot of money to buy these unlimited amounts of bonds being issued. Otherwise, the prices of these bonds and interest rates would go up when they're issuing so much. Oh, no. So this is the monetary base. Guess what? GDP, look at the bottom line, grows slower than ever. Money supply, only a little faster. So no big deal there. All, the only thing correlating with this is the S&P 500. Stocks love this. Push down interest rates. That alone creates higher valuations for stocks because stocks project, investors project stock earnings out 10 years, which are usually, and they usually over in, and estimate that, but whatever. And then discount that earning stream to the present using the discount rate of the 10 year treasury bond. So they push that two to three percentage points lower than it would be, which alone could double the value of stocks. Just that adjustment in the discount rate for that. I'm not gonna go into this chart. I could spend 20 minutes on this. Just focus on these two red things. Last time we had a monetary base surge, um, a boom. Um, 
money supply went up three times the monetary base in the in the boom before went up 9.7 times so much lesser response in money supplies i already kind of showed but look at the far right financial assets went up 20 and a half times for every dollar printed now that's an impact and that is the bs i'm talking about okay but also look in the middle the yellow of all the areas net wealth and real estate stock market and bond market the three big markets for financial assets stocks got the big they all got a bang stocks got the biggest bang so stocks have bubbled the most and will go down the most but real estate will go down too and bonds will go down too at this point really quickly the fed you know is printing all this money for years and years and years they finally said you know we don't have to do this anymore we'll kind of taper back and buy less bonds and flatten out and when that happened this chart shows the reserves that banks hold got taken down and all of a sudden I, this is a little technical so so don't worry about this too much but they normally banks the big banks fund when when banks and investors and financial institutions who, who are doing a lot of leverage investing and lending and stuff when they need extra money overnight to balance out all their requirements and regulations they just lend it to each other overnight well they stopped doing that in september of 2019. this red line is showing the the total money printing of the Fed, all of a sudden then it went straight up. All of a sudden we had this repo crisis. You'd hear in the news back in uh, September, October and on, um, on, on CNBC. And everybody said, oh, this is just a little crisis and the Fed just needs to step in and give a little liquidity. They printed $763 billion in a matter of four months until the virus hits. That, that's way more than their peak money printing at 60 billion uh, a year uh, back, uh, you know, when they were doing that for six years straight. So this, this was the first sign there was something wrong. And I was telling my people, and guess what? That extra money printing, where does the money go? And, and again, here's what you gotta get about money printing and why it's different than normal bank lending. Normal bank lending is the, the central banks will make it a little easier to lend money or, or make short-term interest rates a little lower and then banks will lend money and then if that money is paid back then they get that and then they re-lend and you can multiply money because the banks only put 10 percent of, of of their deposits against those loans that's how you create money naturally and if the economy's healthy then that works but but if the economy's not healthy people don't pay back their loans and it doesn't work and, and then that that backfires when they print money and buy financial assets, which they primarily buying bonds, but Japan's buying stocks and now the Fed's buying uh, uh, junk bonds and corporate bonds and, and they'll eventually buy stock. What they're simply doing, they're not putting money into the economy, they're not giving it to consumers, except they did a little bit recently, or to businesses or to the bank. They are simply putting more money into the pool of financial assets, which is real estate, bonds, stocks, as I showed everything, more money chasing the same goods which bids them up they're creating a financial asset bubble to offset the downturn in the economy to make people feel wealthier the problem is the top one percent own 40 to 50 percent of those financial assets and the top 20 percent own 88 percent so it doesn't go to homer simpson now back here we'll show the whole the the printing of money kind of peaked in late to the end of 2014 at four and a half trillion dollars of bonds they had in their balance sheet and it just they just kept it flat so they weren't withdrawing it or destimulating but they weren't stimulating further well they did decide to start drawing down saying oh see the economy's okay uh now we're going to taper back because the economy doesn't need this anymore and i'm like yeah sure sure it's been living on nothing but stimulus since uh late 2008 early 2009 so when they tapered, okay, you see the first bump, that was the repo thing, and then the next bump is the virus. Oh my God, <laughs> they printed, ended up printing $3.44 trillion in eight months between the repo crisis and the, and, and the uh, coronavirus uh, crisis. That is almost as much as they printed in six years in the biggest money printing operation in history. They printed 3.7. So Here's the thing, and I've been warning investors about this for a long time. It's very simple. 
to keep a bubble like this going, you have to print and stimulate exponentially more because you're going against something that wants to deleverage, wants to deflate, wants to go into negative prices, deflation, not inflation. You're having to print more and more, and that's what they just did. So, okay, if they just printed 3.44 trillion in, in eight months, well, what are they gonna have to print next time? Another, another six trillion in three months? You see where I'm going. There's a point where it looks so ridiculous. And of course, the law of diminishing returns. I've been comparing this whole money printing and overstimulus debt bubbles are one thing they'd start, but money printing is a whole nother level. It's like a drug addiction. It's just a financial drug. Borrowing more for many years or decades than income or GDP is growing will always end up in a debt bubble, will always cause financial assets bubble, always cause a crash. Just that I showed that earlier. Private debt peaks are always going to be followed by a crash and a deleverage. Well, again, printing money just does that on greater level. So we got the worst bubble and financial addiction in history, and I'm saying it's getting ready to burst. Harry, can I chime in with a couple of things? Yes. So, um, uh, because we do need to wrap up, but I want to make sure we complete a couple of thoughts here. Um, uh, so, uh, first off, uh, you've distinguished before on the podcast with me uh, talking about real estate markets. And, you know, obviously everybody has to sort of broaden it when they're speaking in sound bites on the media and so forth. And just distinguish, if you would, between you know what we've talked about about the cash flowing real estate that makes sense versus the cyclical markets and this stuff that's just pumped up with fake money printing and uh, you know these ridiculous prices. I mean, all of this uh, West Coast real estate and expensive real estate around the world, not just in the U.S., was overvalued before we ever heard the word COVID, right? Oh, oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. it's been overvalued this increasingly this whole boom. Stocks have got more and more overvalued. Real estate, particularly in coastal hot cities. So, so we have bubbles everywhere. And these bubbles are bad for the economy. They put money into speculation instead of productive investment. And they give people a false sense of wealth that's not going to last. So people overborrow, overspend. And that's why it has ends up so badly. So, yes, yeah. and, and when this that- burst, you have to get into safer assets, into high-quality bonds, in cash flow positive real estate. Now, even that real estate, even apartment buildings that are healthy, positive cash flow, not so overvalued, will go down some because everything gets reset, but they won't go down as much as McMansions and more expensive homes and commercial real estate gets absolutely clock clean. The other thing is that if you have cash flow, if you have properties or certain businesses that are throwing off cash flow, hey, the value of that business or the value of that real estate may go down some, not as much as something that's not or that's more overvalued. But if you've got cash flow, here's the real opportunity. Now think about this. All types of things start to fail. All these defaults. Banks got a lot of bad apartment building, bad real estate, McMansions, commercial real estate, everything. The people who have positive cash flow don't have to buy that real estate when they want that bargain to increase their rental properties or whatever they're trying to build into. You just use your cash flow, go into a bankruptcy and say, I will take over this loan at a 50% discount <laughs> with no money down. And it's a win for the bank and a win for you. So cash flow positive real estate not only holds up and, and, and pays you money in a downturn, <laughs> it gives you a revenue stream to leverage into bankruptcies and buying things. And really quickly, as I, and I hit this, this is an incredible chart, Harry. I yeah, mean, look it, at it this is, inc- this is, this shouldn't happen chart is what it is. Right. I had to do but, an but it's happening thing. because the bubbles burst, people are pushed into the rental market. Is that the point of this chart? No, this is happening because baby boomers did, oh, sorry, did not save for retirement because they grew up in la la land. I'm like the general, they're coming into retirement. Yes, they're starting to see bubbles burst, more volatility in stocks and real estate. They saw the first big real estate crash. They're realizing the only chance we have to retire now that we're turning, moving in our 60s, is to sell our overvalued McMansion, which puts them selling it at the top of a bubble, which is smart. They're not doing it to be smart. They're doing it out of desperation to fund my, they realize, gosh, my McMansion's worth a lot. I paid off most of the mortgage. The best way of me to fund my retirement plan, I never say, is sell that McMansion instead of buying a downsized townhome to retire in or house. I'm just going to rent. More and more baby boomers are renting. So normally the bottom green line of this chart 
This is your normal younger people who dominate apartments. People buy rent until they can afford to buy in their early to mid thirties. Okay. So that's not growing because the millennials have already done that. Now the recession will extend their rentals and curb their buying even more. So rentals will hold up as they do in a downturn. The prices may fall some, but your cash flow should largely hold up, which is a big advantage. But again, where's all the growth? Older people, particularly this top reddish line, 18.6 million new renters from baby boomers and the other analysis, which I got into, I won't get into today. The older these boomers get, they rent at even higher rates at 75 than they do 65 or 60. So it only gets better. And more and more baby boomers, when they see financial assets fall, will say, my gosh, I've got to sell my real estate. It's overvalued and I've got to rent in retirement. So this is a huge new group. Now, the great thing about these baby boomers, they are older, more financially stable. They stay with you longer. They're not just in there for three to four years so they can have a kid and buy a house. They're, you know, they're, they don't wreck the place and, and, and shoot heroin and take drugs and, and you know, God knows what. They're better clients and they like the more upscale side. So my strategy for people in multifamily and rentals, buy apartment buildings and even single family homes if you want to, that get crushed in the downturn and refocus them towards retiring baby boomers, as well as millennials who will increasingly want to buy again, starter homes at first, and then trade up homes in the next boom. So, so, so sell your marginal properties now this summer here. And if anything's marginal cash flow and not strong, sell it now. If it's really strong cash flow, or, or put it this way, look at all your assets and say, look, I want some assets to show I have positive cash flow to wheel and deal. That's one way to wheel. I also want as big a pile of cash as I can have the wheel and deal. They're both to your advantage. You have to determine that balance. I would take more of the cash myself because that's pure advantage. You want to be able to buy stuff, whatever you're into. You're into apartment buildings, multifamily, medical facilities or not, another thing that will hold up better and, and then, then be in more demand as baby boomers retire and get older. You want to buy stuff in the downturn in the next few years and reposition it for what's going to grow coming out of this. And, and uh, so, Harry, that means sell your $800,000 house in California, right? Yes. Yep. I would be selling, and that's exactly what yep. I did, yep. selling my primary home. Yep. If I have some cash flow positive real estate that, that's going to look good in this thing, I may keep that. Um, and then I use the cash from, from the real estate that's either way overvalued, even if it's apartment building, you think it's overvalued or, or more marginal. Mm -hmm. Take the cash out, sell real estate you have that's not, you know, you don't have to have. Yep. Pile of cash plus some cash flow positive properties. You come in this downturn with some cash flow property power plus a wad of cash, you are going to double, triple, quadruple your wealth unless you're an idiot.